Films. Today, we are going to take an introductory look at particles. Those particles we're going to mess with, well, we're going to learn how to create them, size them, color them, adjust them, provide forces against them, and then we're going to put them together in a comp that I specifically had Gargoyles at Work and Blackbird Call Sue help me put together. You can find it as a download right below. If you like the content on the channel, it's the first time you've been here. We do a lot of benchmarking for DaVinci Resolve as well as some other tips and tricks. If you'd like to say thank you for the comp file and for the video, feel free to buy me a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com slash johnsfilms. And with that said, let's get to it. Now, Fusion doesn't have to be terrible. I'm going to start with an effects library here at the top of my edit page and come to my toolbox and effects. Here I can drag a Fusion, Fusion composition onto my timeline. I'll stretch it out for a little bit of space to work with. And now I click the magic wand at the bottom, which is Fusion. Here I start with a general node. This is the media out. Everything that I build in my node tree culminates in an output, which is this media out. It is what will finally get rendered into my video in my timeline where I place the fusion composition. If we'd like to start playing with particles, we need to generate some. To generate particles, you use a P emitter. So I hit shift and spacebar, and I can type PEM, and it gives me a P emitter. Alternatively, this is a P emitter here on the quick tab toolbar. Or I can go up into my effects library, use the tools, and filter down through particles to get where I want to be. Most of what we'll be doing for speed is shift and spacebar and typing to search. Once we have our particles, we have to have a way to display them on the screen. We do that with what's called a P render node, and this renders them out. Frankly, we can take that P render, pipe it into an output, and that is our simplest possible particle composition. You can see it's randomly generated some particles out of the P emitter it has rendered them to my 2D workspace, and it's pushed them to the output. So if I were to go back over here, you see I've got a little ball with all of those particles. Now, why is it in a little ball? Well, good question, let's start there. Everything to do with how it is initially set up and how it behaves over the lifespan of it native to the particles is set up in the P emitter. There's five different pages up here. There's only about three of them we're gonna worry about right now. What I'm going to do to tackle that sphere problem, it looks like they're all coming out in a circle there. I can come into my region tab, or region page here, the fourth one, and I can choose, now I'm going to place them all over. Notice you can't really see them anymore. They're here, there's some, but they are well uh, spread apart because there's so few of them, you don't really see them. The last area that we can go to to make sure we see them, though, is the style page. The style page allows you to choose what type of particle we're dealing with. I'm going to choose a blob, and I'm doing that because it has a d discrete size control. You can see them there. They're a little bit bigger. I'm going to go ahead and just type 2. There we go. Got them a lot bigger. So now that we've got that, we have the basics of particles. And I'll show you there's a pretty easy way that you can generate here in a two-dimensional particle world uh, fun things to do with them. So with the P emitter highlighted, I'm going to hit Shift and Spacebar, and I'm going to type P, and then I'll go with turbulence, PTU, enter. That adds a turbulence node right here after the emitter before it gets rendered. What does that do? Well, let's watch what happens now. See how they're all moving around? They weren't moving around before, were they? Nope. That's the turbulence, and you can have it change only in one direction if you want. So now it's just going to go up and down, which is why I can make it so it goes only side to side. There we go or obviously all of them, and Z-Strength pulls it in and away from you as you're sitting here at the computer. Really, that's more applicable in the three-dimensional space, which we're about to step into. So I've now pulled the P-Render off of Media Out. Media Out is always a two-dimensional space, and I've got my P-Render here. I'm going to change in P-Render to a three-dimensional output, and that creates a three-dimensional scene, which you can see here. You notice it also changed pretty dramatically the size of my blobs. It is much more sensitive when you're in a three-dimensional space to the size. There we go. And now we've got a three-dimensional space. I'm moving around inside of here with my middle mouse button held down. With the alt and middle mouse button held down, 
to rotate and grab and hold with the middle mouse button. You can zoom up and down or control and the mouse button uh, with the wheel zoom in and out. So now we've got these popping up. We've got them varying over their time. We've got turbulence going to them. Let's see what that looks like. Pretty neat. Now your question is definitely going to be, how do I connect my 3D world into a 2D output? And for that, you have to render it as a 3D object, but you also have to provide it something that it knows to look for when it talks about sending it out. So I'm going to go with a render, and it's a 3D renderer that can then render it to media out. But I'd like to have better control over the lighting and the camera effect, because at this point, you just get the big blob. What if I want to move through it or around it or animate anything related to it? Well, to do that, and by the way, you can also get better performance by right-clicking in this toolbar area, turning off high quality, turning off motion blur, and then enabling proxy. There we go. I'm going to add a camera to this, and it's a 3D camera, and that 3D camera can get piped into my renderer. And now, all of a sudden, I've got a 3D world where I can see... Remember, that's Alt and hold down the middle mouse button. My camera, I'm going to grab it on this axis and pull it back so it gets more of the particles in the camera space. And now what we can see in the renderer is a different view. So I'm going to open up two view windows. My right one is going to stay on the renderer. My left one is going to show what happens when I move the camera around. So here we are, and I can move the camera, and notice on the right, the particles come closer and further away. So naturally, what am I going to do? I'm going to keyframe that motion on that camera, and it's going to fly through that mess. So let's start here. I'm going to use uh, keyframes, which are these diamonds on the right, and they lock a position for a camera at any particular point. Right now you can see it's here, and the blue axis is the z-axis as it moves in and out. So I'll keyframe it where it is. And then I will move forward in my timeline to where I want it to be. And at this point, I'm going to move it so that it flies through. There we go. I can mess with the Z over here, or I can alternatively grab this and move it around. So that in between those two keyframes, watch this, it's going to fly through and give that whole fly through effect here. Nice. Now if I wanted to speed it up or slow it down, I can always spline, go the Z offset for the camera. And here we're going to find, there we go. Box that out. Press F to get an ease in, ease out. There we go. And now it'll be a little more dynamic. There we go. All right, so that's fun. But we can do even more cool stuff with this. Uh, I could put in some lighting and then make the lighting pass through. But I think what we're going to do right now is build something actually useful. Now, this is all fun and games, but useful would be neat. I'm going to get rid of, I don't need it to be a 3D world. I don't need a camera because of that. can take care of the turbulence in the emitter. All right, you know what? We're going to start over. Space shift P emitter is because I want to emit some particles. However, this time I'm going to use an image emitter. This is a special type of particle emitter that allows you to feed it what you want it to look like. And in this case, I'm going to use my logo for my channel. And from that, I need to render those particles. So, of course, P render. Again, that shift and spacebar. Start typing. And now I will pipe it to an output node and center that in. There we go. You can't see it real well, but there's some orange spikes right there. So that's uh, the good stuff. So those orange particles are there, and what have we learned? Well, often when you add particles, you don't see them at first. And so you need to go in to change the style of them in the emitter. Well, guess what? The p-image emitter has the exact same style control page. And I can change these from points to blobs. I can change the size of the blobs so that they're up a touch. There we go. And now when we zoom out, we start to see the channel logo. Okay, that's kind of cool. But how do we make that fill in a little bit better? That would be nice. Well, we can make the size bigger, or we can change the density here. 
The density is the number of particles that are going to exist in here. You can see it very quickly beefed up. So that's better. Uh, I might still make these a little bit bigger. Let's try this. Yeah, now I get a little bit of brightness. So here we are with our image emitter. Now what I'd like to do is make that fit a little bit better. It does look kind of cool the way it's stationed right now, but I'm going to use this for something. So to do that, I'm going to provide a ellipse to mask out that logo into a circle. I've renamed that logo by pressing F2 on it and being able to rename that node. I hit shift space and I choose ellipse with EL, drag that over here. And now I can show this on one, show this on two. There we go. All right, so we want to now grow this to where it is the exact width of the logo and the height of the logo. Is it off? Nope, that's about right. Now when I pipe this into my logo and I go to my uh, render, I've got a perfect circle around my logo. My logo is made up of a bunch of little particles that are really densely packed in there. And now I can really have fun with it. Here we have, I've added a P turbulence with the basic P image emitter. With the, the turbulent force, it now makes it wavy so that you can see it a bit like a flag. I'm gonna hit P image emitter and put a particle force. That's a PD particle directional force. And this is going to allow me to make this thing move around. And I've got all of them getting pulled down to the end down there. I'd like to get them all moving in different directions. And there's a few ways to do that. One of the more fun ways would be a peak custom. Maybe that'll be a future tutorial as I get better at it. But here we are with the directional force. And I can set this direction here. And in fact, you can see right here, this is the P directional force. It points at which direction I'm gonna have this thing going. And I can change the strength. But what I'm going to do is start by keyframing the direction. And right now it's at negative 90. I'll just leave it there to start. And here at 180, we will make it be at 3,632. You notice there's no more particles on the screen. That isn't because they all ran off the screen. It's because my particle lifespan is probably not that long. So I come over here and look, and sure enough, it is... 100, change it to 400. Again, it's a property related to the creation of the image emitter or particle emitter. And so that's where I go to change that. Now we'll go back to our force and let's see what happens as we play through this. Remember, it's getting tugged all over the place. You can see it start to get pulled in different directions as it spins around. And you can see the turbulence working on it. All right. So we are ignoring the region that it's in. The thing we want to change now is the probability. This is the probability that any one particle would get affected in any frame by this directional force. Check out what the difference is now. Now this thing just starts to kind of break apart and it's starting to just fuzzy out and they'll start to fly off the page in different areas. So if I really want to speed that up, I just take, take the power of it up. And now as it starts to break apart, you can see it's trying to turbulence and it's doing it, but then it's also just scattering out into nothing. The joy of that is if we play it in reverse, it looks like it's coming back together. Add a pretty cool sound effect and you have a whole bunch of particles that build up and build my logo. So this has been some fun with particles. This is a cool thing that we can do. You know what, bonus tip, we're gonna turn this into a three-dimensional particle space. I can do that just by pulling off that P render and changing that to three-dimensional. Now that it's three-dimensional, I put it on the plane. Much like we had before, I hit the middle key, the middle mouse button and the alt key. But notice these particles are now huge and we don't need them that big. So back to the emitter where they get started in the style page at the bottom, we have ourselves size control. And I can get them down to something reasonable that I'm now able to view. Let's see what it, there we go. So we'll move back around so we can see it. There we go, my particles in three-dimensional space. Nope, whoa, there they are blowing all around. That is cool. So now if we were to play it backwards, whoop. And what's even more fun, let's do that. So we're gonna render this out and then I'll be right back. All right, so something I'm gonna do before I render this out, I need to connect this to a media out, obviously. So 
I hit P render 3D, oops, render 3D. And then from here, I can pipe it into my media out. I'd like it to have something behind it. And so to do that, I'm just gonna merge in a background uh, and I can do that with a BG. Notice the background is green. That means it's on top and I don't want it on top. I want the particles on top. So I've moved the background to the back and now I've got, whoops, renderer going to it. And the renderer is not a mask. It is a, there we go. And now I've got my particles Look a little hazy. So that is a black background. I'll change it to white. Yeah, I like that better. And it's going to bust apart. Whole lot of density in particles. I could probably take the density down even further. Do that in the image emitter. Down to maybe here. Yeah, probably will work. Yep. And now it breaks apart. You can see a little bit more separation there. Finally, what I'm going to do is add a camera. And that camera is going to allow me to control the view so that I can get a little closer. So there we go. Make sure we build those in put the camera on one and now I can see where it is. Boom, there we go. And here we are. Pretty cool stuff. So let's do that render and I'll be right back. For those of you that like the benchmarking on the channel, I thought you might enjoy this. We're in Fusion, we're playing with particles. Notice the 2080 Ti GPU utilizations at 13%. And in fact, if we were to look at that, it's only going to be hardware encoding for us. Uh, task manager. Here we can come in and look at the individual pieces of the GPU. And you can see it's encoding for us uh, the final rendered frames, but the frames are 100% being rendered in the CPU. If we look at the CPU, it is multi-threaded in the particle workflow and every single one of my cores and threads is busy. It's still no joke. It's nine minutes worth of rendering here. So it is quite heavy to get playing with these things, especially in this 4K timeline. But when it gets done, they look so sweet. Uh, next thing we'd probably do would be add some lighting and some different effects with movement. But this is all we're going to play with today. All right, and our render is done. It took 12 minutes and 52 seconds, though I accidentally included part of another comp, which definitely chewed it up some. So now let's see what we're going to do to use that. Well, I'm going to go back to my timeline. Keep in mind, those are all fusion comps. And I'm going to import some footage. It's a, call it B-roll. Import. I rendered it to my E drive, which is my scratch and output drive. And you can see the particle logo. Now I grab that and drop it here on my timeline. And this is, sure enough, the rendered output of our work. All right, so that was cool. It's kind of linear, meaning it just kind of breaks apart at the same speed. And so I'd like to change that a touch. Whoop. All right, the end of that, I don't need all of that. I only need about to there. So now I can change the speed here using any of our methods to change speed, but I'm gonna bring up the retime curve and zoom in on it with Alt and the mouse wheel. And this is the frames. I don't want to retime the frames. I'm gonna retime the speed. There we go. And now, with the speed line selected here, I'm able to put some breakpoints in there if I want to. Um, what I'd really like to do is maybe put one here at the end, raise, raise it up. Oop, there we go. Raise it up. Pull this over to get it faster. I'm going to put a little Bezier curve on it by hitting this curved one instead of the straight linear. Now I can spread that out some. And what happens? starts to break apart and it goes faster and then it starts to slow down at the end it's probably the effect i'm looking for now i'm going to press alt on the keyboard click on my clip and drag it over and boom i've got a perfect copy right click on that retime controls and from here i can go in and change it so that it's in reverse rewind but we're going to do that a different way alt and hold it click right click change clip speed reverse speed change and it says I'm about to replace a non-linear speed map with a linear speed map so what does that mean well check this out so this one does it with that curve on it this one now is going to be actually it did as well I think let's pull the retime curve up for this one 
sure enough, it is a straight line, whereas this one, if I get the read time curve on it, it's got that bend. So now I'm going to put a point on this line. What we have to remember is we're going backwards. So if we go up, we get longer. If we go down, we get faster. I'm going to go down to 300. Click here. And this speed, what is this speed at? 192? What does it need to be at? Well, that's 300, and this is 301. It's weird. All right. Change that point over. Hit this. It's kind of mind bending, but if we were to match this exactly, it should give us the exact effect we want. All right. So let's zoom that out. Oh, it needs to be a lot faster. There we go. Let's see what happens breaks apart and now it zooms back together beautiful so we can play around with that to our hearts content maybe it would be a pretty good uh, effect just coming in and hey maybe we put an opacity fade on that so that you don't see them at first and then all of a sudden you faintly become aware of them and they zoom together at any rate Again, big thank you to Blackbird Called Sue and to Gargoyles at Work for assisting me with this one. I got in a couple of hairy situations, and those guys are experts. They knew what they were doing. Otherwise, I hope this helps you if you want to have fun play with particles. Let me know what you use them for. I'd love to see any of your comps swing by the Discord server and share it and share your work. It's a channel dedicated to just that. If this was helpful to you and you want to say thanks, there's always buy me a coffee. I do like the Java. And finally... Thanks for watching, and have a great day.